Welcome, J. Newton Small, Washington Correspondent, Time Magazine. Hi, uh, my name is Jay Newton-Small and I'm a political correspondent with Time Magazine and I'm actually here in Boston for the semester doing um, a fellowship at the Institute of Politics at Harvard. Um, so I'm ex excited to be here in Boston. Thank you guys for everyone for having me here. Um, I, I thought, I, you know, given all the stories today, I thought I would actually start out today talking about how I got started in journalism because it's kind of a roundabout way. Um, and I think a lot of journalists kind of take this path. I never wrote for my high school newspaper. I never wrote for my college paper. Um, I actually studied art history at Tufts here in Boston, and I thought I was going to um, go become a curator in a magazine, and I was going to, you know, spend my life looking at beautiful paintings. And um, instead, I ended up doing an internship at Christie's my senior year of college, between my junior and senior year. And I hope there are no, no art historians in the room or nobody who works for Christie's because it completely dispirited me <laughs> and I thought I'm not going to spend my life, sorry, sucking up to rich people to get them to buy, sell, and loan art. Um, and so I you know, was, went into my senior year of college thinking, oh my god, I have no idea what I'm going to do with a degree in art history <laughs> um, since I'm not going to work in art. I went to a speech that a, a friend um, dragged me to. It was a guy named Neil Shapiro, who was then executive producer of Dateline NBC. Um, and he talked a lot about how journalism was uh, for the curious. And I was a very curious person. I liked the idea of going and seeing things for myself and uh, sort of investigating and asking questions myself. And so I ended up interning with him for a year at uh, NBC. And then I went to journalism school, since I had no journalism experience. And then um, when I graduated, I went down to Washington, D.C., where I was working for AFP, Agence France Presse. Um, and my roommate was dating the White House correspondent for Bloomberg News at the time, the senior White House correspondent. And he was looking to hire some help. And I ended up sort of you know, working with Bloomberg, becoming one of their White House correspondents. At that time, we had four White House correspondents because we were a pool. And, uh, and we all, um, you have to do it's this 24 seven hour shift. Like you, there always has to be somebody there covering the president because anytime the president moves or thinks about leaving campus or um, doing anything, he always has to bring press with him. And so you're always there pretty much. And so it's, you kind of switch off and, and um, back and forth. And so I kind of really fell into the world of political journalism. It was not something that I really thought I was going to do. Um, and to give you an idea of how sort of um, awkward and daunting it is at the age, you know, in your early 20s to be a, a White House correspondent. My first question was in a Rose Garden press conference with George W. Bush, and it was, I think, uh, 2000 and early 2004. And it is the most nerve-wracking experience on the planet when the president calls on you in a te live televised press conference. And it's just, you know, you're asking the most president, you know, the most powerful person in the world a question, and you want to sound eloquent and really, really smart. And he calls on you, and um, I was totally not expecting to be called on. I had only been covering the White House for two or th actually about three months at the time. And, um, and I totally froze. And Helen Thomas, I don't know, does anyone know who Helen Thomas is here? Yeah, so she's great. She was really scary. Um, and the Bush White House hated her. I mean, really hated her. And um, so in live press conferences, she would sometimes scream out questions during the press conference because they, she, she never got called on. And it was actually kind of awful that they were, they were really not great to her. Um, and so she started, I paused, and I was freaked out. The president's calling me, and he has no idea who, he, who I am. And he's looking at his card, and he's saying, Jay. J. Newton Small, and he's sort of looking out at this audience in the, in the Rose Garden, and Helen Thomas starts screaming a question, Mr. President, and now I'm looking at her, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, even worse frozen, like I have no idea what I'm gonna do, and I'm like, oh my God. And so he's like, J, J, please, <laughs> question, what's your question? So finally I'm like, he's like, J, are you here? And I'm like, here. <laughs> and he's like, oh, J, you know, J, this is great. So what's your question? And I'm like, um, how are you? <laughs> and he's like, well, I'm very good. Uh, how are you? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm good, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. And he's like, but I don't think that's your question for me, is it? And I'm like, um, no, no, no. My, my question is, and I was 
I actually thankfully had prepared a question and I finally sort of, out of a lot of garbles, spit it out. So the, the point of the press conference in, was actually announcing uh, the White House's revisions um, as suggested by the 9-11 Commission to um, what they would, the changes they would make um, in order to enhance national security. And one of the questions I had was, you know, you had this position of national intelligence director, the 9-11 Commission had essentially recommended that it be a presidential appointee and the president instead had made it a Senate confirmable position. And I said, well, why would you give away that power to the Senate? And he actually had a really interesting answer, which was, I, I think it's too much power for the White House to have, and that given all of the miscommunications and intelligence that had led to 9-11, that just having one person decide who the national intelligence director is would probably lead to more miscommunications, and therefore he thought it was healthy that both branches of the government weigh in on this. And so, he, he finished answering the question, moved on to somebody else. I was probably about to throw up in the bushes behind him. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I went back to my office in the, in the in, in, so the, the journalists, for anyone who's ever been to the White House, we have, um, you know, the briefing room, but then we have offices actually that are sort of beneath the, well, the West Wing. It's sort of where the pool used to be where John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe hooked up, if anyone knows that. Um, and so, and there are these tiny, tiny little cubbies. They're actually incredibly disgusting. So the government is not actually subject to the laws that they pass. And so there's no OSHA regulations whatsoever. There are like rats everywhere. I'm not kidding. It's really disgusting. Um, and it's really humid because it used to be a pool and like, um, so I go back to my little cubby, and the White House replays all press conferences that, that they have, um, and they, um, over the loudspeakers, because, you know, we're usually, as we're journalists, we, we're typing, listening to it again, hearing what the news is, and they thought that my portion was so funny that they would play it twice. Um, and so I was completely mortified. I literally was kind of in tears, and I went home, you know, that, that evening just being so embarrassed about, you know, being on national TV and kind of completely flubbing this question. And uh, I mean, the transcript is kind of awful. You know how they have transcripts in the White House where it says laughter in big, bold letters? Like, <laughs> there were a bunch of those in, the, in, that, in that transcript. And so, um, and so, but the next morning, my, my, my boss, who had stopped dating my roommate at this time and was just a friend, um, came to me and, and he threw the, 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 the Washington Post and the New York Times on my desk and said, your question was the lead question for both papers. You know, you got the best answer out of anyone in that press conference. And he was like, so even if you didn't ask it the best way, you actually knew your information and you asked it, you asked a good question that produced news. And he was like, and that's much more important than style. So to me, it was a lesson in confidence. And as I look at you guys today, I'm still terrified of speaking in public, frankly. And so I still need a lot of confidence to do that. And, um, but it was an, an interesting lesson in confidence that I have now since, um, watched other women, especially other female politicians, apply as they've gone through um, the sort of zoo that is Washington, D.C. So um, I left Bloomberg uh, in, after four years, and in 2007, I went to Time Magazine, uh, where I covered the Obama campaign and the Hillary campaign for 23 months. Um, and then I had my first cover story in... Uh, that comes up, yeah. Um, in a, well, actually, it's my second cover. Sorry, it's out of out of out of sequence. But um, I had my first cover story um, on Sarah Palin, which was in 2009. Um, and uh, and I'm just going to zip through these. That's me interviewing the president, uh, the White House, and Snowmageddon. This is uh, <laughs> Congress. Um, anyway, so. Um, the Sarah Palin cover was an interesting experience because, um, again, as a journalist and as a woman, it's, it's such a different, I think, perspective um, than you get as men. And so she had decided to resign as governor in July of 2009, and she made this announcement. There were all these correspondents who went up to cover her, and um, she gave these interviews to a bunch of TV folks. And I, of course, was way behind on the scene. I didn't realize she was doing these TV interviews. Her staff kept saying, you just need to catch up to her. And catching up to her ended up mean, meant chasing her to Dillingham, Alaska, which is um, it's like a two and a half hour plane ride from Anchorage on a plane where you can roll the windows down. <laughs> and 
it was, um, you know, and I, I literally, I went with another male correspondent who basically at that point was like, I'm not getting on a prop plane to go anywhere. And I was like, I'm gonna get this interview. I'm gonna get it, even if it means I have to like stalk her. So, um, so I went out to Dillingham, Alaska. I basically stalked her. Um, and she ended up inviting me to have, to have dinner with her family. Um, and it was at her mother-in-law, Blanche's place. And it was really awkward because they'd just come back from, um, from fishing that day. And they were all uh, like, I don't know if you know that much about Native American Indians, but Todd is like one sixteenth Native American Indians. So they they sort of follow the Native American Indian practices of fishing, and so they um, they have this sweat hut where when they come back from fishing, they don't actually shower because they smell really strongly of fish, and so they all go into this sweat hut and they sweat out the fish smell. And for the Palin family, they do this in the nude. And so I was like, they were like, well, we're going into the sweat hut and you can keep talking to us if you want us to talk to us while we're sweating or you can just stand outside. And I was like, I'm going to be a dogged journalist. I'm going to go in. And so, so I went in and it was an experience. Um, but it got me my first cover story. Um, and so... So, um, so after Palin, you know, I, I, I continued covering Congress, as you can see, um, and I've done stories on Mitch McConnell, um, on a cover on John Boehner. That is, this next one is uh, my original Sarah Palin cover, so I've done a second cover on Sarah Palin since then, interviewed lots of people in Congress, and um, by the end of 2011, I was getting really, really dispirited with Washington. and. and you know, there's a lot of dysfunction. Having covered Washington for 12 years, I was, you know, um, had never seen Congress not come to an agreement ever. And when the debt ceiling happened, I think a lot of us, including not just me, but a lot of longtime correspondents felt like it was um, really just a broken system. And so I actually left covering politics for a while and decided that it would be much healthier to cover the dysfunction of Haiti, <laughs> um, and Egypt, which is another cover story, and gangs in Glasgow. Um, I also did, you know, went to Iran, Iraq, uh, the border of Syria, um, and discovered in covering other countries' dysfunction that, you know, our dysfunction, while pretty bad, was actually not relatively as bad as it could be. Um, and I came back to Washington in um, the end of 2013, and I got interested in what I felt like was the only functional people left in Washington. At the time, I was the only woman uh, writing for a Time magazine in Washington. I was the only one in the only woman in the bureau, and, uh, and my bureau chief actually said to me, "You know, there's there for the first time there are 20 women in the Senate. Why don't you write a story about the women in the Senate?" And I was like, "Really? You're going to get the woman to write the woman's story?" Um, but you know, he was like, "He was like, just give it a chance. You know, see if, how it goes." And so, I um. I actually got really interested in the women because, you know, Washington was getting increasingly more broken. They weren't talking to each other, and the women were the only ones who were really talking to each other. They had spent um, years having these dinners where they would hang out, like, once every six weeks or so, and they would, um, you know, sort of kvetch about the men. They would talk about their wedding plans. They threw Susan Collins a, a, a bridal shower a few years ago. They'd talk about their baby showers and their, their grandbabies. And, their, and they'd really become friends. And so in a time when Washington, where, you know, where members of Congress basically don't spend much time in Washington anymore, Newt Gingrich in the 1990s um, started giving budgets to congressmen so they could fly home every weekend um, and started encouraging people not to stay in Washington during the, um, you know, during, after sort of office hours. Um, people didn't know each other anymore. I mean, they weren't friends across the aisle. They never hung out with people who were not, you know, part of members of their own party or people they'd come in with as classmates. And the women of the Senate, frankly, sort of became the only functional people for a while. And so when the government shut down, I'd been talking to the women and writing about them, or I should say reporting about them for about six months. Um, and I was sort of in a great position to do a story about when the women got together to, um, reopen the government and um, they uh, it was sort of a fun moment you know they they 
they really, nobody in Washington was talking to each other. They had a pizza dinner the night before at, uh, in, uh, in Jean Shaheen's offices. They were like, this is really stupid. Let's just go to the Senate floor tomorrow. Let's just start talking. Even if it's just amongst ourselves, you know, at least we'll be talking, we'll get the ball rolling. So the next morning, Susan Collins went to the, you know, went to the Senate floor and, um, and she was joined by Barbara Mikulski, from, uh, a Democrat from Maryland, and uh, Kelly Ayotte, a Republican from New Hampshire. They literally were like, this is silly. Guys, this is dysfunctional. Let's start talking. Let's have a conversation. And the conversation turned into a group of um, eight, eight senators. Six of them were women, who then started the negotiations to reopen the government, which happened about five days later. And so this was the story that uh, ran in Time magazine. And um, I wrote that headline. And I literally was just being snarky. I thought my boss would never let it stand. <laughs> um, and like, but he did, um, and, it, and it stood. So um, after this, I had a lot of offers to write a book. Um, but half the women in the Senate are already writing their own books. You've probably, some of you may have read Kirsten Gillibrand's book or Elizabeth Warren's. Claire McCaskill's is coming out soon. I didn't think they needed another book on women in the Senate. But I got really interested in the idea of critical mass. And so I am writing a book on critical mass. And what is critical mass, you may ask? It is actually about, um, there's a lot of studies, whether it's about, you know, whether it's a legislative body or a Navy ship or a corporate board, where somewhere between 20 and 30% is a tipping point and women really begin to have an impact. So less than 20%, and women's voices generally aren't heard. Um, whether it's the men don't listen, or the women don't feel confident, as I have my own self, in my own career, I've sometimes not felt confident speaking up. Um, or, you know, for, for whatever reason, 20% doesn't quite work, but 30% does. And so one woman, she's sort of a token, two women, they're sort of, eh, right, they don't really have that much of a much, a much bigger impact, but three women, and they begin to really have an impact. They're, they can reinforce each other, their voices are heard. And in the case of the Senate, because there were 20% of the Senate were women, they actually, those 20% of women um, shared eight committees and were ranking members on two committees. That's, those 10 committees were half the committees in the Senate. So they were really had outsized influence in that session. Um, and to tell you how much reaching that critical mass meant in the Senate, they actually produced 75% of the bills that passed in the last session, just those 20 women. So you can see that it's a great, so for me, it was a really fun topic. So I have a chapter, obviously, on the women in the Senate. And then I started talking to other women in Washington. So it turns out that the, private, the public sector is leading the private sector in this phenomenon. And all three branches of the government are reaching critical mass at about the same time. 30% of the administration, the upper levels of civil service, um, and appoint, political appointees are women. Um, and 35% of the federal bench are women. Um, that is compared to 17% of uh, board, uh, corporate boards who are women and about 21% of high-level executives in the private sector. So 10 years ago, the private sector actually led the public sector, and now the public sector is ahead of the private sector. And so, um, so my book looks a little bit at, at that. It looks at, it looks at all these sort of examples of how women who've reached critical mass in the public sector are really changing the way we govern, changing the way we command, changing the way we rule on courts. Um, but then I also look at sort of the challenges that remain in the private sector and other little pockets of industry. And so there's some great um, examples of, for example, the Navy. Um, 30 years ago, were required to integrate women into their ships. They had no idea how to do this. The first female captain was a woman named Darlene Ixtra. She was completely miserable and failed at it. Um, she was during world. It was during the, the the first Gulf War in the 1990, and she was named the first female captain. Um, her crew didn't respect her. She had a crew of 100. Her boss thought she was a publicity stunt. Um, she really, you know, talk, she's talked a lot about how miserable she was, but they took her experience very seriously, and they basically did a ton of studies to figure out what, you know, how they could do this right in the Navy, and they came to this magic number of 27%. Um, and 27%, it turns out, is when you reach a critical mass and people in the Navy ships actually not only are happier with each other, they, you know, the men accept the women, the women you know, sort of reinforce each other, they feel comfortable, but the ships actually become much more productive. They are the most productive ships in the Navy, um, compared, because obviously there aren't that many women in the Navy that every ship can have 27%, so the rest of the ships are just all men. Um, but the ones that have at least the critical mass of women are the best run ships in the Navy. So there's all these great little pockets, you know, 
know, in police forces, and as another example where um, women tend to, uh, the presence of women as, as B cops, and a lot of, there's been a lot of studies actually since Ferguson on this, tend to lower sort of the temperature in violent situations. People tend to draw their weapons less. Uh, they're much better at community outreach, it turns out, than their, than their male colleagues. So there's all these really interesting examples of why it's important to get critical mass in your workforce. And you know, on, on corporate boards is another great example. They have, um, there's an argument that if, if uh, there'd been more women in banking, that um, Lehman Sisters, quote unquote, is called the argument that the, um, <laughs> that the global financial crisis wouldn't have happened because women take less risk. And there's a ton of studies that show if you have a, a, corporate, a board with critical mass of women that you have to restate your earnings 55% less, you actually, most companies earn on average about 24% in profits. And so there's all these really good reasons to do it, and yet people aren't doing it. And so there's, um, there's, and you can sort of ask why, there's all these studies, and you know, it shows that like men only look to like people to put on corporate boards, and there's obviously a big push to change that. But, and, and sort of the end of my book, I look at why it's important to change that. And that's because moving forward, you know, we're going to have the entire baby boom generation retire, and in the, by 2030 we'll be short, about 40 million workers in our workforce. And the only way to make up that number, sort of this cliff that we're coming down to face in our workforce, is to bring women up to full employment. And women currently make up about 47% of the workforce, but they make up two-thirds of minimum wage workers and three-fourths of shift workers. And so if you don't actually bring women up to full employment in mid- and upper-level executive offices, then our economy is pretty much going to fail. So there's really good reasons in which to do this. And um, there's a lot of solutions, which I explore in the book, which hopefully you guys will buy and read. <laughs> and it's out in December. So um, basically, it's called Broad Influence. Um, and, I, and that's why I'm here to talk to you. So um, I hope you guys will buy it. And, um, and think about critical mass in your own situations and, like, and, and also confidence as well. So thanks. Thank